Hey everyone, welcome to week seven, day one. Uh, this week is gonna be about color, finally. But we're gonna approach color in a slightly different way. Uh, we're gonna speak about the colors, each of the colors of my palette, each of the hues of my palette, each of the pigments of my palette, better. That's a lot better. And today we're gonna start with white. Also, and I think what I'm gonna paint has to do with my materials. So the stuff that we use paired with the colors in my palette. Let's see how that goes. Okay, brand new week, which means a brand new theme. And for this week, we decided to uh, speak about color, but not really about color theory, but we're just gonna dissect the colors that I use in my palette and also try to uh, give a brief history of those pigments, more like an anecdotal history. The way we humans actually decided on which pigments were going to be used for certain hues. Now, it's weird that I say hue and the first pigment that I'm going to speak about is white. Because if you go strictly by what it means to be a hue, then you wouldn't really be able to speak about white. That's why many, many people don't really consider white as a color. Um, they kind of mix the scientific definition of white, of the color that actually absorbs no color. It actually reflects every other color. And in that sense, because it reflects all the uh, colors that are in the uh, visible spectrum for us, for the human eye, then we don't really understand it as a color. We don't give it a hue. There's no way we can actually say, well, you have a hue in the sense that we understand it, as in the definition that we give yellow, orange, red, uh, blue, violet, green. But here's the weird thing. In painting, we actually have to understand it as a color. It is a pigment, and it is a pigment that has very, very specific properties. And those properties that that pigment has actually affect our mixes. It affects them in every single way. It affects them in how opaque the mix is going to be, how light fast is going to be, how it actually is going to be affected by light, its uh, resistance to light. It's actually going to affect its temperature. Pigments like titanium white are very, very cool, so it actually is going to make a cooler mix. And it's going to lower saturation, for example. So in, in that way, if we really, really think about it, White pigment has exactly all the same properties that every other color has. It doesn't matter if it's not like a saturated cad red or a cobalt violet, you know, those very, very almost sensuous, like eye catchy colors. Regardless of that, it is still a color. So that's why people are usually mistaken, in my view, when they say, well, I actually have two colors in my palette a yellow ochre, cad red, and then the other ones don't count the titanium white and the ivory black, no, those don't count. Those are not colors. No, you would have four colors in your palette. You always, always, always have to count your white as a color. Many of the inability to get to the, the mixing potential that your palette has, I think comes from the fact that we don't view uh, white as a color. We only view it as a uh, lightening agent, which is a big, big mistake because many times if we use white to actually lighten certain hues, they actually stray away from that hue and they become something else. I'll give you a super uh, easy example of, of colors kind of straying away from, from their hue, deviating from their hue. If you have cad red, for example, which is a, a red orange, and you were trying to make it lighter, it's best to actually lighten it slowly with a cat orange and then a cat yellow and then a lemon yellow rather than using a titanium white straight because what titanium will do is actually deviate the cat red which is again a red orange and actually make it kind of go towards a red violet because it is so 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 cool titanium white that it actually is going to affect uh, cat red's temperature and it is so so opaque that is going to kill the saturation very, very, very quickly. So if you wanted to maintain the red-orange hue while making it lighter, it's actually not advisable to use white as um, the color that is going to make your mix lighter. Because it's so ingrained in our mind that white is supposed to be the one color that we use to make everything lighter, 
we overuse it constantly, constantly, constantly. I remember an exercise that Max gave us one time in class because it's very, very common for people to overuse and abuse white, particularly titanium white because it's very, very chalky and opaque. And if you overuse it, then everything you mix it just becomes um, pastel -y and chalky, which is not bad. But if you're aiming for, let's say, more chroma in your mixes and what you're getting is a very chalky color, then, you know, you're off. And he just said, well, just put like a, like a pea-sized amount of white in your palette and just use that for the entire session. A session meant like a six hour uh, painting from life session, which is almost impossible. If you really think about it, if you're covering a painting that's, I don't know, 11 by 14, you know, using that little bit of white is almost impossible. But what it was doing, it was just creating discipline. It was just telling you, okay, really go for your white only when you have to. And that was super, super important because almost every single painter starting out usually overuses white. So just be very, very mindful of that. The white that I'm actually painting here is a very scrunched up old tube of titanium white that uh, Michael Harding does. This is not a promotion. I'm not getting free white just because I mentioned this white. If you guys know me already, I'm going to openly speak about my materials, but none of these people are sponsoring me. I'm not getting any of these paints. I don't want to be gifted any of these paints because I want to speak about the good and I want to speak about the bad and I want to do it freely. We should share like our common experiences, the good and the bad. I use Michael Harding's white and the reason I use it is because when I was painting in my sketchbooks, I needed my paint to dry fast. That was the one thing that I really, really needed because uh, from the beginning I was like, this is going to be an oil painting sketchbook. So I really need my pages to dry as quickly as I can and that's the reason I used uh, liquid, alkyd medium, as my only medium because it is the one that dries the fastest. So I started out with titanium white, titanium dioxide, but titanium dries very, very, very slowly. It's a beautiful pigment. It's the white that eventually replaced the lead white that had been used for centuries. But it dries very, very slowly. And I remember the first paintings I was doing, because it's so spongy and kind of creamy titanium white, and by the way, that's why they add zinc white to titanium white, because titanium white tends to be kind of rubbery and softy, and zinc white is actually very brittle. So they mix the two of them to make titanium a little bit less chalky uh, and a little bit more transparent, which is uh, zinc oxide's property. If you're using titanium white, titanium dioxide, what you gain is that your color is going to be super, super resistant to light. It's not going to modify. It's not going to change with light. It's not going to change with time. It's not going to be affected by oxygen or by other atmosphere conditions. It covers a ton. I mean, it's super, super opaque. So it overpowers almost every other hue that you have in your palette. But it dries, it dries slowly, you know, and and for us oil painters, not so much if you're working a la prima, if you're just doing a one shot painting. But if you're working in layers that you have to be sure that your you know, under layer is actually completely dry and stable before you start putting things on top, uh, it takes time and it takes a ton of patience. So just be mindful of that. If you're using titanium white, its creaminess comes at a cost and which means that it just takes a lot more time for it to be stable and for it to dry. The thing is, I don't know which dryers uh, Michael mixes in his titanium white. This is, by the way, his titanium white number three. But he does mix it with dryers. I mean, there's not many options if we're using like traditional dryers. There's cobalt dryers or coutre dryers. I'm not sure which dryers he's mixing in. It dries very quickly. I mean, I could do a very kind of lush charged stroke on my paintings and it'll be dry by the next day, like touch dry. And it can be very impasto stroke and it'll be dry next day, which is kind of crazy if you really think about it. If you touch the layer of the paint, sometimes it flash dries, which means like the outer layer of the paint, the skin of the paint has dried, but underneath the paint is still moving. And it'll give you a false sense of security because you're thinking that your paint has dried, has fully dried. And so you start painting on top layers and layers on top. But if the, um, the bottom layer is shifting, just think about it like you're constructing a building on top of a swamp. If that swamp keeps moving, now the building is going to come down. 
And that's what happens with paint. If your underlying layer of paint just keeps shifting and moving because it didn't dry properly, if you didn't give it time to cure, then your uh, layers that are on top are just going to crack. Cracking usually comes from the under layers of painting, not from the last layer of paint. So just be mindful of that. Because you're using dryers, you're actually accelerating the natural drying time of uh, the drying oil and the pigment. So you have to be very, very careful with that. In terms of history, we know that ancient Greeks, like 400 BC, were using uh, lead white, lead carbonate, as a pigment. And if you want to read more about it, it's actually fascinating the way they produced uh, lead white as pigment because it involves just putting filings of lead, you know, the metal, along with vinegar, which was an acid, and uh, manure, like cow and horse dung, in an enclosed space that had to heat up. So imagine the acid heating up, you know, from, from just the sun beating down on it, and the gas that was uh, created by, the carbon dioxide gas that was created by all the manure, and all of that combined actually sort of eroded uh, the uh, lead, the metal, and it created lead carbonate, which is insane, which is actually amazing. Um, there's, this, uh, there's this author, Victoria Finlay, that says uh, one of the coolest things about lead white in her uh, color book. She says it was the transformation of shit into sugar. Now, lead white was the best white that we could use for centuries. If you think about it, 400 uh, BC to till the 19th century, that was the white for painters. That's the white that we would use to paint with and to do our grounds. Before that, before lead white was used as a ground and as a pigment, it was all calcium carbonate. It was whiting, chalk, uh, limestone. But that pigment was not very strong. It was very transparent. And just painters didn't think it had the body that was needed to paint uh, with white. When lead white came, it was just precious, but very poisonous. That's something we all know. Nowadays, there's tons of restrictions in tons of countries that don't let us use lead white as, as pigment. The production is prohibited in many, many countries now. And that's why the prices uh, skyrocketed. And if I have to be honest, I used probably 20, over 20 years ago, lead white that was produced commonly I mean it was still a very um, very expensive pigment but it is still somewhat different from the one that it's produced nowadays which is a shame but again it's health over aesthetic qualities and we have to be mindful of that and I'm guessing that eventually you know 20 30 years from now lead white is going to be prohibited the production of lead white is going to be prohibited the health concerns are not the same as a young apprentice going into a barn where for 90 days, <laughs> you know, cow dung and manure and excrement were incubating uh, with, <laughs> with vinegar. Imagine the smell of opening that door <laughs> after two months and a half and just smelling, you know, all that carbon dioxide with all that, you know, vinegar just acidifying. <laughs> I don't know. You you couldn't pay me enough to go gather that lead white uh, in the in the seventeenth uh, sixteenth century. So just be mindful of, of of that. Eventually, we realized that just inhaling all that uh, lead dust into your system is just incredibly incredibly hazardous for your health, for um, for your nervous system, and and of course you can't you know eat lead white, which is just extremely extremely poisonous. Middle of the 19th century, uh, they discovered uh, zinc oxide, which is uh, what we call zinc white nowadays, which, you know, at the beginning was called Chinese white. It was introduced as a watercolor pigment initially, and it's very, very transparent. It's a slightly bit warmer than, than titanium white, very brittle. A lot of mistakes happened when people were using zinc white as a primer many, many years ago because they used it as a ground and they had no idea uh, of how brittle it was and eventually their paintings six months after that were cracking like having really really fine cracking that's why many paintings of the 19th century are in worse state than many paintings that are, were produced in you know 17th century and then eventually in the 20th century uh, right before uh, World War One I, I think uh, we started using titanium white 
and it became the more ubiquitous white and that's the one almost everyone has in their palette nowadays. It's a tough white to paint with, uh, like I said at the beginning, just knowing that it's a, such an opaque color just makes it very, very difficult to use because chances are if you don't really know how to um, use it properly, you're going to overuse it and you're going to kill your saturation. Uh, does killing your saturation make a bad painting? Not at all. And this gives me a chance to contextualize the way we always do, which is trying to find examples of painting that I believe use white in just masterful ways. And I'm only going to speak about one of my favorite painters. I spoke about him during a previous painting, which is uh, Ruprecht, Ruprecht von Kaufmann. And Ruprecht this, did these series of paintings that I find a lot of congruency with because I haven't spoken to him about these particular paintings and I, I would love to know more about that. I'm probably going to speak to him about that. But um, I know he was mixing wax with his paints, just trying to achieve like a more opaque, like a dense, smoky, milky atmosphere. What I used to do was paint my paintings, you know, traditionally and then actually mix in a wax medium, which, I mean, my medium was equal parts terps, uh, resin, which is uh, Damar varnish, stand oil, and obviously beeswax. I would melt the beeswax first, take it off the heat, then put the uh, solvent in first, the terps, and then mix in the oil with the resin. And it's very, very important that you take it off the heat. You don't want your terps to heat up because they explode at I think it's 65 degrees uh, Celsius so be mindful of that when you're using heat plus solvents that's not a good combination when I was finished with my painting I would mix uh, white paint with my medium and then brush all that stuff on top of my painting which gave me like a, a sort of ghostly image and then I would work on top of that once again with a wax medium now and based on the values that I had and on the sort of muted hues that I now had by filtering my original painting through all this like milky waxy white, I would then paint it again. And what I got was just this beautiful atmospheric painting. I have no clue if that's what um, Ruprecht does. I think he, he just uses like a wax medium and he does sort of veil the painting with wax. But there's, there's a ton of white in his paintings, and I absolutely love the atmosphere of those paintings. I think they are incredible. They obviously speak about stuff that I loved when I was doing my own little experiments and exercises with wax mediums and mixing them with, uh, with white paint. So uh, that's about it. That's our brief talk about uh, white, its uses, and I hope you enjoy it. Tomorrow we're going to speak about yellow, the yellows that I use, and uh, tiny, tiny little anecdotal history of yellow hue. So thanks for hanging out. Bye.